Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation's Pediatric Cardiomyopathy Webinar, updated, uh, excuse me, updates in medical management for pediatric heart failure patients. My name is Gina Petty. I'm the Executive Director of the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation, or CCF. CCF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to finding causes and cures for pediatric cardiomyopathy through the support of research, education, awareness, and advocacy. Established in 2002, CCF has grown into a global community of families, physicians, and scientists focused on improving diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life for children with cardiomyopathy. Questions are encouraged and welcome during the presentation. Uh, questions can be submitted via the question box in your control panel. Uh, next slide, please. We will be reserving the last 15 minutes or so for questions. So please feel welcome to submit your questions throughout the presentation as you think of them. And then we will review them at the conclusion of the talk. We are also recording this webinar today so that you can review it again at a later date or for those who are not able to attend in live time today. We are thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Neha Bansell. Dr. Bansell is an attending physician at Mount Sinai Kravis Children's Hospital and assistant professor of pediatrics at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Her clinical focus is pediatric patients who have heart failure due to cardiomyopathy or congenital heart disease, as well as pediatric transplant patients. Dr. Bansell received the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation and Kyle John Remizuski Foundation Research Scholar Award. She is a member of the Pediatric Heart Transplant Society, Action Learning Network, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation, and the American Heart Association. Dr. Bansell is also the podcast host of In the Flow, Conversations with Pioneers in Pediatric Heart Failure and Transplantation. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bansell to join us today and welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Gina, and thank you so much for uh, to the uh, Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. They always do such great webinars and education for uh, parents and families that are out there for patients dealing with heart failure, uh, and I really appreciate the invitation. So I'm going to quickly share my screen. All right, are you, um, just let me know if you're not able to see um, my screen. So we're going to talk today about uh, updates in medical management of pediatric heart failure. Um, <clears throat> as we know, we've been treating heart failure for a long period of time, and uh, we're just going to talk about, focus on the medical uh, management aspects today uh, with some um, tiny little updates. Um, I have no disclosure uh, disclosures. Uh, I did want to say in the beginning of this top um, this talk that this presentation is intended for families and parents and is educational for them. Providers are welcome to listen and actually contribute. Um, I, I welcome um, any contributions that all the providers that are listening in today. Um, uh, and, and if they have any tips and tricks up their sleeves, uh, please ha be happy to um, you know please share. So we're going to discuss today what is heart failure. What are some of the definitions of the heart of heart heart failure, you, you know, you or your family might have, uh, family members might have heard some of the terms that are being thrown around. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about all the different, um, um, you know, terminologies. We're going to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of it. Um, you know, uh, what are the different types of heart failures? What is a class? What is a stage of heart failure? And then we're going to talk about um, uh, heart failure treatment. So when you're acutely ill or acutely decompensated, um, you know, uh, we're going to talk about medications like diuretics, inotropes, which is IV medications. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, chronic management of heart failure. So, you know, once you're out of the acute ill phase, if you go home, what are some of the medications uh, that you may go home on and, and, and so on and so forth. So very simply put, Heart failure is the inability of the heart to keep up with body's metabolic demand. So it could be for a multitude of reasons. Um, we could have uh, 
an inherent weakness in our heart muscle. Uh, we could have um, an infection that is, um, you know, causing our, our heart muscle to not be able to pump out. We could have uh, anatomic problems, so like coarctations or things like that, where um, you have like it's a plumbing issue. There's like uh, um, you know there's issues in in the blood getting out of the of the heart. So so for whatever reason, if you have uh, you know the heart is unable to keep up with what the body needs, what the different organs um, need uh, in our body. Um, it, uh, if, the, if the heart is unable to keep up with those demands, uh, we call it heart failure. And it is a clinical, it's very important to recognize that heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. So based on symptoms, signs, um, that is when we say that somebody is in heart failure uh, and not so much like uh, a number or an echo number or an EF number. Um, those define different types of heart failure, but essentially, um, we define heart failure by looking at the patient and seeing how the patient is feeling. Um, so uh, just looking over here, and I'm going to talk about what these different like uh, acronyms mean. CO stands for cardiac output, which is basically what the blood the heart is pumping out. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that the heart is pumping out with each heartbeat. And HR stands for heart rate, which is um, my my uh, what my heart rate, like, or the patient's heart rate at that time. So we define as what cardiac output is defined as the amount of blood that is pumped out by the heart every beat times the heart rate. So it makes sense mathematically. Um, so in heart failure, essentially what happens is our cardiac output or the amount of blood that gets out of the, our heart is decreased. Now it can be because of decreased contractility. So the heart itself is, uh, has become uh, weak. And so the body compensates by doing a few things. Number one, it increases the afterload. It increases, you know, the body's resistance. So your um, um, your what we call systemic venous uh, systemic vascular resistance goes up. It increases the preload, which is basically the amount of blood that is already in the heart. It increases your heart rate. So you know, the patients feel that their heart is beating very very fast. And we treat all of this by, you know either ways, some medications that increase the contractility of the heart. We decrease the afterloads. So there are medications that help us decrease the blood pressures uh, it, enough if they're, if they're not already super low. Uh, we use diuretics to decongest the body, which helps decrease the preload. And we use medications to decrease the heart rate of the body. So these are the ways that we treat medically using uh, medications. Um, uh, we treat or heart failure. And these are some of the things that you will see today as I talk through my conversation. So what are some of the ways um, heart failure presents in children? So uh, lots of symptoms can show up um, as, as heart failure. So you can have swelling of the legs, ankles, eyelids. Occasionally your abdomen is kind of swollen and, and bloated. You can have, uh, especially toddlers and kids, you know, they can um, breathe abnormally fast. So they're very, very, what we call tachypnic, that is um, fast um, breathing. Um, there can be very labored breathing or patients may feel that they're short of breath. Uh, lots of fatigue. They're all the time tired, taking long naps and sleeping longer. Um, in teenagers, we often see patients presenting with nausea, with vomiting. They just don't tolerate any food and they don't, uh, they don't like to eat. They lose weight, they lose appetite. Um, on the, um, you, so you could also have weight gain during heart failure because you tend to retain a lot of fluid. So everyone, every um, patients have a lot of puffiness um, and they can also have uh, weight gain uh, initially. Um, a lot of cough, congestion in the lungs, um, Breathe, uh, breathing difficulty, especially while, while playing or doing activity or going up a flight of stairs. Patients like start complaining that they can't uh, climb the stairs at school um, and loss of muscle mass. And you can have some changes in skin and uh, body temperature and color. But essentially you can see it can mimic very common pediatric illnesses. If your child is sick with uh, the flu, you can think that, okay, you know, that you know, there are lots of like overlapping symptoms, and that's why heart failure sometimes it's very hard to diagnose in kids, and often does not get picked up till like 
patients have gone to multiple ERs or have gone to multiple places um, for evaluation before it's actually picked up. And it's actually a very common story that we hear, not because the physicians miss something, but because the symptoms overlap um, uh, you know, a lot of the symptoms of common pediatric illnesses. Um, there are lots of ways that we categorize heart failure. And uh, you might have heard your, uh, you know, doctors talking about um, all these different nomenclatures, and I'll try to explain to you slowly. Number one being which side of the heart is involved? Is the right side of the heart is involved or the left? As we know, the heart has four chambers and two sides. The right side pumps to the lungs and the left side pumps to the body. So depending on which side of your heart is failing, you can have right heart failure or left heart failure. Um, whether the abnormality is in the contraction, so the squeeze of the heart, that is called systolic dysfunction. Or if there's problems with the relaxation of the heart, so it, it does not allow blood to come into the heart, that is called diastolic failure. Um, and it also then is classified by how, uh, how functionally you are incapacitated. So based on your symptoms, whether you have symptoms only with exercise or whether you have symptoms even when you're sitting down and doing nothing. And that is called a functional classification. So we have something called New York Heart Association classification or the Ross classification for pediatrics. And I'll go over those. Um, we can have primarily problems with, you know, all the blood that is not going out of the heart kind of backing up whether into the lungs or whether into the different organ systems. And you can have something called backward failure or forward failure when you see problems because the organs are not getting enough blood because the heart, when it squeezes, is not able to pump out enough blood. And you can have problems with um, a low cardiac output where not enough blood goes out of the heart or, or high cardiac output. So there can be too much blood flow. Sometimes we call patients who are who have holes in the heart like VSDs or other arteriovenous malformations and high output cardiac failure because there's too much blood that's going out, but it's going to the different parts and it's stealing from other places. So as we were talking a little bit ago about NYHA, which is New York Heart Association Heart Failure class uh, Classification, um, so it's divided according to the symptoms uh, of the patients. So you can have class one through four. Class one is basically you have no limitation of physical activity. You're able to um, do all kinds of ordinary physical activities. Class two is when um, you have some slight limitation of physical activity. Uh, class three is you're kind of comfortable at rest, but anytime you do any activities of daily living, like going to the bathroom or going grocery shopping or anything that kind of limits you because of your symptoms. And grade four is basically you have symptoms even when you're sitting down and barely doing anything. So now obviously like some of these um, uh, classifications does not really, uh, it cannot be extrapolated to kids because kids obviously are not going grocery shopping. And so for kids, there's something called Ross classification of hearts, uh, Ross heart failure classification, which basically um, is kind of extrapolating from the New York Heart Association um, into like what kind of different symptoms. So you have class one where patients are completely asymptomatic, class two where they, when they run around, they have shortness of breath or dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing, um, class three being, um, you know, you have failure to thrive, which is basically kids are not able to grow, or you have, um, when, when the babies, you feed them and they're like huffing and puffing while they're feeding, or they're feeding for a long period of time, those are, uh, those are, those babies fall under class three. And class four is basically when the baby's just resting and doing nothing, you're still noticing that the baby's grunting and is having retractions and is working really hard to breathe. And you can see kind of all the muscles in the neck, in the chest, kind of working really, really hard, even when the baby's just resting. Um, so that is the heart failure, Ross heart failure classification um, uh, for, for kids. There's lots of difficulties in studying um, pediatric heart failure uh, or number of patients 
it's very, very small. It's such a rare disease. And each center in the entirety of the United States sees only a handful of patients a year. And so anything to study it systematically requires it to be this huge multi-center collaboration. Um, and that's why it's been very challenging to study um, heart failure medications, the different types of medications in pediatric heart failure. So most of the guidelines are level of evidence C, which is basically not enough randomized control trials exist. And we use these medications from the adult heart failure studies. We just kind of extrapolate it we, um, and then use it. Uh, and then once we see that there's no safety issues, there's no, um, uh, there's no bad side effects. And then we start to study um, what are some of the gains from those medications in pediatric patients. Um, medication pharmacokinetics, which is basically how pediatrics, uh, pediatric patients uh, metabolize these medications is very different from adults. Like a baby's metabolism is very different from mine and yours. Um, we don't know what doses to start these babies on sometimes. And those are some of the big challenges that we have in pediatric heart failure. And so as I go along these um, uh, medications, you will soon realize that there's not a ton of studies, randomized control trials in pediatrics. Um, and a lot of these medications have been grandfathered in from adult side, and we use them and we find them to be very beneficial and efficacious. Uh, efficacious. Um, and they have just been kind of being, they're, they're just now kind of being used in the, in the pediatric world. Um, so let's quickly talk about the staging system of, of heart failure. So um, let's talk about the four different stages. So we have stage A. Uh, we talked about, you know, the functional classification. And this is now what we call stage A as what are, uh, who are some of the patients who might be at risk. So um, stage A are patients who are at risk for heart failure. So there's some risk factor in you uh, that puts you, puts you at risk for having heart failure in the future. For example, you have a genotype for, for cardiomyopathy patients. Let's say your child inherited the gene um, ge genetic mutation from you. So now that kid has a risk factor for having heart failure in the future, for having cardiomyopathy in the future. Let's say a child had cancer um, and it got received chemotherapy that that exceeded the safe amounts or puts the patient at risk uh, risk for future uh, cardiotoxicity, which is basically over a period of time, you start to see these patients develop um, heart failure. Uh, so those patients who, who are at risk for heart failure, they um, are stage A. Um, stage B is uh, patients who um, are, are not so uh, uh, who are at risk, obviously, um, who are at risk for heart failure, but they don't really show signs and symptoms of heart failure per se, but have something like some sort of like uh, risk factors with um, with some sign. OK, so, for example, some patients who have persistently elevated troponins or there, there's something called brain natriuretic peptide levels. So they have elevated those or these patients who have cardiac catheterizations and we measure what are the pressures inside the pumping chambers of the heart and the filling pressures. So those are patients who are pre-heart failure. So they have some risk factors of having heart failure as well as some signs that are showing that they, they might soon impending, they might have heart failure. Stage C heart failure are patients who have symptomatic heart failure currently. And stage D are patients who already have a heart failure and they, they have very marked symptoms um, and despite being on medications persistently have heart failure. Um, and, and these patients, advanced heart failure patients often need something called um, mechanical circulatory support, which is um, ventricular assist devices, the so mechanical support, or they need uh, evaluation for heart transplantation. Uh, the 2022 ACC guidelines came out recently for heart failure, ACC and EHA, and they also defined um, heart failure uh, according to this. So it could be uh, a new onset heart failure or de novo heart failure where, you know, a patient who presents with heart failure, and this is what we see the most common in pediatrics, right? De novo heart failure, where patients have no history of heart failure in the future or no like history of heart attacks or anything, and just like present with um, 
with heart failure. Um, th there are patients who have resolution of symptoms and signs of heart failure. So these are uh, patients uh, in remission, you know, heart failure patients who, who, get, who get better. So, you know, are controlled on medications. We have patients who are, um, have persistent heart failure. So despite, you know, having, um, uh, being on medications, you continue to have some ongoing symptoms, signs, limitation of your functional status. So you're not able to do the things that you wanted to do. And then we have patients with worsening heart failure where it's self-explanatory. So you have worsening signs and symptoms. Now you might have heard of these terms called hef ref, hef pef, hef ref, you know? So I just wanted to explain what that means. So um, the, the ACC 2022 guidelines uh, lay out very clearly what they define. These are of course, the caveat here is this is adult. So um, hef ref, which is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is something that we measure on echocardiogram. It's basically the amount uh, of um, percent of your left ventricle that contracts and pumps the blood forward. We normally like for it to be in pediatrics more than 55%. Um, and so patients, um, in adult patients, we define half ref or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So basically your ejection fraction is reduced as if your EF is less than 40%. Um, half ref is heart failure with moderately reduced um, ejection, uh, mildly reduced ejection fraction, which is basically if your EF is more than 40, but less than 50. And half PEF is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. These are patients whose um, EF is more than 50%, which is considered normal in the adult world. Um, and so if you have normal ejection fraction, but you still have heart failure symptoms, um, and these are patients who uh, we call have hef -pef. Um, So that is based on just on echocardiogram um, findings and your ejection fraction number. So how do you do? How do you determine somebody has heart failure or not? There is a diagnostic algorithm that was presented um, in the latest, latest guidelines. Um, so obviously, like you want the patient to have an assessment. You do a clinical history, you do a physical examination, you do some lab work, you do ECGs. Um, and then we measure something called natriuretic peptide, which is basically a marker of heart failure that is used in all these different trials and all these different uh, studies uh, and, a, and a hugely elevated NT pro BNP or N, uh, NT uh, pro brain natriuretic peptide indicates that patients um, uh, ventricle, ventricles or the pumping chambers are under extreme stress. So if you have elevated levels of either NT pro BNP or BNP, um, that indicates that the patient is um, in some form of ventricular or pumping chamber stress, most likely heart failure. And so then you do um, transthoracic echocardiogram, which is basically the ultrasound of the heart. Um, you confirm the diagnosis. You classify it according to the symptoms. We talked about the stages. We talked about the classes. And then, of course, we talked about based on your ejection fraction. Um, and then you evaluate what are some of the precipitating factors, what happened, why is this patient presenting now? Um, and then you initiate treatments based on how sick the patient is looking. Talking a little bit about the pathophysiology of um, of what happens in heart failure. So, um, you know, the, the red heart there indicating the left ventricle, which is the pumping chamber of the heart to the body. Um, uh, over a period of time, it becomes big like a balloon, kind of blows up. Um, there's LV dilation. And over a period of time, it fails and causes left ventricular failure. Once you have um, left ventricular failure, uh, and I'm going to try to show my arrow here. So once you have left ventricular failure, you have low cardiac output. So remember cardiac output we talked in the beginning, which is the amount of blood that comes out of the left side of the heart and, you know, perfuses or gives blood to the rest of the body. So you have low cardiac output and your blood pressure can often be very, very low in this, in these patients and in, in patients who have low cardiac output because not enough blood is going out of the heart. 
Now, what happens is if not enough blood goes out to different organs, your organs are not getting perfused. So different organs like the kidneys, especially, you can have renal failure. Your, your muscles, the rest of your body is not getting enough blood, so you can have fatigue. A lot of the teenagers and you know kids, we start to see some behavioral changes and we often um, you know think that it's secondary to the fact that their brains are not getting enough blood flow and they start to show a lot of behavioral changes. Um, the body reacts. There's something called neurohormonal activation in the body. And the body reacts and reacts to this low blood pressure, low cardiac output, and, and starts to produce all these different um, hormones and all these different um, uh, peptides in the body and the proteins in the body, um, which, for example, um, epi, norepi, which increases your heart rate. Um, you can have increase in renin and angiotensin II, uh, which increases your afterload, your basically your resistance of your blood vessels, like they can become really, really kind of stiff and tight. Um, you can start to retain salt and water um, but with, with the aldosterone. And so you can have something called edema, which is basically swelling of the body. Um, and all of this kind of results in what we called adverse LV remodeling. So the kind, um, the, the left ventricle essentially, which is a muscle starts to remodel bases on, based on all of these different types of um, body's reactions. Um, and so this is what happens when the left side gets dilated and fails. What happens when the right side of the heart kind of dilates and fails? You have uh, what we call increased central venous pressure. So all the blood from the body comes to the right side of the heart. Once that heart starts to fail, it kind of backs up into the different um, part organ systems. So central venous pressure. So the venous pressure in the, in the body is really elevated. Um, it can um, it can back up into the liver. Uh, what happens in that situation is you can have liver congestion. Sometimes you can have liver failure. Um, and when the left side of the heart kind of dilates and blood backs up, it's the it backs up into the lungs because the left side of the body, left side of the heart gets blood from the lungs. And so once the left side starts to fail and dilate, the blood backs up into the lungs and you can have shortness of breath. You can have orthopnea, which is um, uh, basically you're not able to sleep straight on a bed. You start to use pillows. You can have cough in the middle of the night. You can have uh, paroxysmal nocturnal uh, dyspnea, which is basically in the middle of the night, you suddenly feel like you're not getting enough breath and you suddenly like wake up and start to run towards the window because you just feel so suffocated. Um, these are, of course, in, in uh, you know, adult patients. These are all um, symptoms that were named there. But, you know, in kids, you will start to see that they'll start to breathe heavy, breathe fast, um, and, you know, just really, really all the time working really hard to breathe. And so... Um, the, this is what happens in heart failure. And as we're going to talk about the treatments, we're going to see how we address all these different, um, uh, how, how we address all these different uh, things in heart failure using medications. So the medication and uh, medical interventions that we have is acute decompensated means you've come in, your body's not able to compensate, you're in the acute phase um, of heart failure. So we have things like diuretics, which is basically because you're all swollen and puffy, we try to get, get your body to pee out that extra fluid. So diuretics make you pee all that, uh, all that fluid. Inotropic support, which is basically IV medication that is infused through an IV um, and, and helps in um, contractility of the heart, as well as uh, trying, trying to maximize that uh, heart's contractility to pump enough blood out. Uh, intubation. So sometimes intubation helps where uh, intubation is basically putting a tube down at the throat and letting the ventilator do the work of breathing. So in a lot of the kids, it often helps to take away that work of breathing, take away the work of breathing from that child. And that kind of helps the child relax and save up energy and helps with, um, you know, symptoms of heart failure. And of course, 
sometimes you come in, you're in a state of what we call cardiogenic shock, uh, which basically means that your body is just in a state of shock from the extreme heart failure. And um, you need, um, you know, mechanical ways. So, you know, machines and, um, you know, different ways to help the, the blood be supplied to the rest of your organs. However, if you make it through the acute decompensated phase, you have something called chronic management, which is basically you go home, you're on all these heart failure medications, which a lot of adults are. Um, and some of the medications we're going to discuss today are, of course, diuretics, which is decongestant therapies. You have something called ACE inhibitors, and you have something called beta blockers, beta adrenergic blockade. And then, of course, we all know that uh, gold standard of treatment of heart failure in pediatrics or in, in adults is heart transplantation. So giving giving um, an, uh, an, a completely brand new heart, uh, which of course I will not be discussing today, but um, just knowing that is sort of like the end, end goal, trying to delay it as much as possible safely for patients, but at the same time thinking at the back of the mind that ultimately um, heart transplantation is, 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 the, is the treatment. Um, just putting in a link here because I know the, the slides are going to be distributed. These, this, these were the 2022 AHA, which is American Heart Association, ACC, American College of Cardiology, and HFSA, which is Heart Failure Society of America. Together, they came up with guidelines for management of heart failure. These were just released last year in 2022. Um, and, you know, these have all the updates for adults, especially. This does not have, unfortunately, a pediatric uh, arm to it. But, uh, you know, this was a big undertaking and they have used all the different new medications that have come out in the last few years and tried to put them into all these different types of heart failures that we discussed in the in the beginning, you know, half ref, half PEF, half MREF, you know, all these different heart failures, how to treat uh, adults with all these different types of heart failures. And they've done a very good job. And for the providers on the call, like it's a really, really um, uh, good document to kind of uh, uh, go through. And they, go, they list all of these medications, right? Like you can see the number of medications that are out there uh, to choose from. And we're gonna discuss only a few of them today in pediatrics uh, that we use. Um, and, um, you know, they, they, uh, the adults go through a lot, um, you know, they have a lot of, lot of options. So, um, but we're just gonna focus on a few that, that are tried and tested and kind of used all the time in pediatrics. Um, so let's uh, go back to that diagram and talk about what are some of the ways that we can help heart failure. So, um, so again, if you can follow my arrow here, so we talked about the heart kind of dilates and starts to fail, right? So the heart muscle is weak. One of the one of the agents that we use is called digoxin, which basically helps with the contractility of the heart. Uh, it's one of the oldest heart failure medications that is out there. Um, you know, people have probably, you know, um, in the audience might have heard of digitalis T parties um, that the old ladies used to have uh, to help with their heart failure symptoms. We talked about decongestive therapies like diuretics, so LASIK. So when you have congestion, so whether you have liver congestion, lung congestion, we can use something called Lasix uh, to try to get rid of the edema, um, to try to get rid of the swellings everywhere in the body. Um, and then when I said that, of course, when you have decreased organ perfusion or decreased blood flow to the organs, um, the body's reaction called neurohormonal activation. So there are ways we can try to work on preventing the body from having these reactions. So one is, one is body's response is to increase the heart rate. So we can use something called beta blockers. Beta blockers actually help us reduce the heart rate of the, uh, of the body and helps us prevent this uh, response. Uh, we can have increase in afterload with the renin-angiotensin system, uh, which increases the uh, vascular resistance of the body. So we can use medications like ACE inhibitors, which actually literally inhibits the, the uh, enzyme, which causes this afterload increase. Uh, you have angiotensin receptor blockades. Uh, I'll call, they're called ARBs. And then um, you have something called ARNI, or you must have heard the name Entresto um, uh, in today's world uh, that we can use to help with the afterload. And then you have... Um, 
you know, um, increase water retention, salt and water retention with aldosterone. So there's something called aldosterone antagonist medication called aldactone or spironolactone. Uh, that is often used in heart failure, which also helps with something called reverse remodeling. So we know that the LV, the left ventricle or the pumping chamber of the heart kind of remodels to um, in response to all of this, these heart failure um, response of the body. But then we want to reverse remodel and get it to to a stage where it it looks like a normal shape or has like a normal uh, form and the muscle kind of reverse remodels to go back to um, not an adverse uh, remodeling and so all of these medications together form uh, help with the reverse remodeling of the heart and controlling all of these different symptoms that we see of the heart failure I'm not gonna talk about each and every of these inotropes, but know that pressors, uh, the name pressors or the name inotropes are different medications, IV medications. You might have heard the name epinephrine or dopamine or dobutamine. These are IV medications given through an infusion when a patient presents in really, really bad heart failure. Um, and they can basically um, change uh, your peripheral vascular resistance, so per the vascular resistance or the resistance of the different um, um, uh, blood vessels of your body in the peripheral system, or it can or it can work on the heart directly, so beta one, which is uh, directly on the heart, and try to uh, increase the rate or or increase the contractility. So all are the all are these different pressors and inotropes that we use in the acute phase when the patient comes in, and the choice of it depends on the patient's blood pressure, on the patient's overall clinical status and pictures, and different centers use different uh, inotropes. Um, diuretics, you might have heard the name Lasix, you might have heard the name furosemide. Um, so it is a very good treatment for um, you know, uh, um, fluid backing up in the lungs, fluid backing up um, in different um, parts of the body, especially like the legs get swollen. And so Lasix essentially helps you pee out that extra fluid um, and it works on the kidneys and causes loss of sodium. Um, and we often use furosemide, Lasix, um, uh, one of the most common medications that is used for decongestion. Talking quickly about ACE inhibitors, so as I said, the neurohormonal activation in the body, um, it, um, it produces uh, an enzyme called ACE. Uh, what ACE inhibitors do is they block that enzyme um, and basically prevents the body from converting uh, a protein angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, uh, and that kind of helps with the vascular overall, the, the blood vessel endothelium system. Um, uh, there are certain side effects. It also bro blocks um, breakdown of bradykinin in, in, in the lungs. So sometimes when you are on ACE, you can have a uh, cough. Uh, you can have some side effects like that. Um, and it helps with overall vasodilation. So basically, blood pre the, the blood vessels kind of relax um, and dilate, and that, uh, that helps with the heart um, to be able to pump the blood to the rest of the body. And um, ARBs, which are basically angiotensin receptor blockades, kind of work in, on the similar pathway or the similar system. Um, so let's just go through first ACE. So as I mentioned, um, ACE um, is um, a, an enzyme that is produced in the body um, and it converts a peptide called angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And ACE inhibitor literally blocks um, this particular enzyme and prevents the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. This angiotensin 2 is the one that is responsible for all uh, the different renin angiotensin uh, activation system, which kind of um, uh, helps us or helps us retain salt uh, fluid, et cetera, in normal patients. But of course, it is uh, inappropriately activated in, um, in, in heart failure. Um, and then uh, ARB or angiotensin receptor blockade are basically medications that block the angiotensin 1 um, uh, or, or angiotensin 2 receptors. So basically, even though angiotensin 1 may be converted into angiotensin, it cannot, um, um, it, it cannot bind to the different receptors. And, and that, um, uh, that is another form of medication 
Um, so patients can be either on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, uh, which both kind of work in similar fashion. They help in vasodilation um, or per peripheral. So the, the different blood vessels of your body, it helps to relax that and eases the work of the heart. And nowadays you might have heard of the name Entresto, Arni, uh, which is basically um, a nat um, natri uh, neprolysin inhibitor. So you have over here, um, uh, Secubitril, which is Arni, um, um, and, and NI stands for neprolysin inhibitor. Uh, neprolysin is, um, um, uh, you know, it metabolizes and produces what we kind of uh, measure in the, in the body. Um, something called BNP, which is a brain natriuretic peptide. It's a protein that is produced um, by the, the, uh, the dilated hearts and ne neprolyzin um, inhibitor kind of helps prevent that breakdown. And um, there are lots of different uh, effects of neprolyzin inhibitors in, um, uh, in adult patients. Um, and, um, you know, we, we have... And Tresto, which is a combination of this medication, neprolysin inhibitor, as well as uh, an ARB. So uh, Secubitril and Valsartan, these are the two salts that are in Entresto. And both of these together um, have been studied in adult patients and have shown really, really good efficacy. I'm going to skip that slide, but um, talking about Entresto and pediatrics. So um, uh, there's a trial called Panorama HF trial, uh, which is, um, you know, uh, out there to study the effects of Entresto. Entresto was studied in adult patients in something called Paradigm trial, which came out probably in 2015 and has revolutionized uh, adult heart failure management and treatment. Um, but uh, so, you know, using, again, like I said, it's hard to um, enroll pediatric patients. So we have 375 pediatric patients that have been randomized um, uh, to receive the study medications um, in Panorama HF trial. Um, it is very important to note that they were able to recruit a lot of homogeneous populations. So uh, in pediatric heart failure, as you can imagine, we have heart failure because of many reasons. It can be cardiomyopathies. It can be because they have single ventricles. It can be because of... Um, um, you know, other syndromes or, uh, you know, muscular dystrophies, et cetera. So it's important to um, enroll similar patients so that you can study the effect of the medications. So um, they were successfully able to enroll a lot of patients and we're, um, we're awaiting the results of the trial. Uh, but at the same time, uh, FDA did approve uh, Entresto for pediatric heart failure and they used that peptide, that BNP or the anti-pro-BNP levels to approve this medication. And on 12-week analysis, they saw that the, um, the peptide, the BNP peptide um, showed really, really favorable trends. And based on that data, they, they already quickly approved uh, Secubitril Valsartan or Entresto brand name um, for pediatric heart failure patients. So a lot of patients are able to receive this and, and insurances are able to cover it for them. Um, beta blockade. So it, this is a medication that basically works straight on the heart. It, it, it causes uh, the heart rate to slow down. Um, it also decreases um, uh, the renin angiotensin system that I was telling you in the kidneys. Um, and um, it, it, it is a very good medication. And one of the medications most commonly used in pediatrics is the carvedilol. Uh, which is what we call a non-specific beta blockers. It blocks two kinds of receptors, both of them, beta one and beta twos. Uh, so that what that does is it decreases the patient's heart rate. Now, as a flip side, it sometimes also decreases contractility. So it's not one of the first medications generally that has started in kids. Uh, it started afterwards, after the acute phase is kind of over and the patient is kind of a little bit more stable. Um, and it also has some antioxidant properties um, and it is one of the very few medications that was studied in a randomized controlled trial in, in pediatrics. Um, unfortunately, uh, even though they recruited a lot of patients and they um, did a lot of work, um, they, as you can see here highlighted in conclusions, uh, they did not, the, the, they did not, it was not a, um, what we call a, a, a positive uh, controlled trial. So it, 
they did not find that carvedilol really, really helped um, heart failure outcomes in children. Uh, however, um, going back and thinking about why that is, um, they think that um, you know, the, the event rates or the outcome rates were so low in patients and pediatric patients. Uh, and, and also the population that they enrolled was so heterogeneous um, that the trial may have been underpowered. And so, um, so despite a negative trial, we still use carvedilol all the time um, in, in, uh, in pediatric heart failure. Now, talking about the new kids on the block, you might have heard this term, SGLT2 inhibitors, which are basically um, used in type 2 diabetes. Um, it's been approved, uh, and, and it was being studied in, in the adult world, and they found that um, it reduced mortality, it reduced the number of heart failure hospitalizations, um, and, you know, in the latest ACCHA guidelines, they, they say that the guideline-directed medical therapy, or GDMT, um, you should consider starting an SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, now, there's a lot of theories out there how this works. Um, it has a, a diuretic effect. It makes you pee out a lot of glucose, so it causes glycosuria, has a diuretic effect, causes decongestion of the lungs, the liver. Um, it, 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 it is said to decrease the left ventricular or the pumping chamber of the heart, the mass, overall mass, and improves the diastolic function of the heart. Um, um, it uh, reduces the stiffness of your blood vessels. Um, it increase, improves the energy processes in the body. Um, and so there's multiple ways in which SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to be beneficial in patients with heart failure. Um, it is. It has been People have started using it sparingly in, in kids. Um, so this is a paper from Seattle Children's. And you can see here as GLT-2 inhibitors were used in 38 pediatric patients. And it seems like it was very well tolerated in patients with heart failure. But we, of course, need to use this in a larger setting in a randomized controlled trial fashion to, to see whether we see the same effects as um, the adults saw in their trials. Now, all of these medications have been really challenging, as I said, to study these uh, different medications. So um, we have something called the Action Network, which is Advanced Cardiac Therapies Improving Outcome Network. This was established in 2017 or 2018, uh, very recently, uh, and it has grown very quickly uh, to over 60 sites. Uh, it has worldwide sites. And they essentially started with um, enrolling patients who only were on ventricular assist devices or and had a VAD registry. However, recently they have expanded to heart, a heart failure registry. So they are now enrolling patients um, who have heart failure. Um, and so uh, they're trying to have different interventions using this heart failure registry. So they are studying, for example, um, uh, an Apple Watch, and they're seeing how uh, heart rates can be tracked using Apple Watches in different heart failure patients and trying to see if they can try to medically manage these patients using the data from the Apple Watches. They are also planning to, to collect data on SGLT2 inhibitors in pediatric heart failure patients and then study it in a more systematic fashion. They do a lot of uh, studies on Fontan patients or for, you know Fontan referrals or uh, um, adult congenital heart disease patients. They do a lot of education for parents and providers. So if you or your family out there, I mean, obviously CCF does so much work for education and awareness, but also uh, action, um, action Learning Network, please go check out their website. Um, you know, they also have a ton of resources if you are hungry for more. Uh, they have a, a, a committee uh, for parents, fact committee. They're always actively recruiting if you wanted to spend your energy getting um, you know, more involved, uh, and they collaborate with all the different societies uh, that are out there. Um, and so Action, Action Learning Network is a great resource, along with CCF, that uh, pa parents or families of heart failure, patients with, you know, kids with heart failure can reach out to for, for education, for resources. Um, other therapies that I did not touch upon today, uh, there's something called cardiac resynchronization therapy, where you can um, instead of 
in, in patients where there is issues with um, the electrical system of the heart, you can try to pace both the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart in a synchronized fashion and try to see if the symptoms of the heart failure get better. Um, I did not talk about mechanical circulatory support today. So you have things like ventricular assist devices um, that are out there. You might have heard the name Berlin Hearts or, or HeartMate 3 or you know, in some cases, we uh, we have patients on ECMO, uh, you know, which is um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is like this big heart lung machine that the kids, unfortunately, who cannot sustain um, uh, are, are placed on. Uh, there are some things like pulmonary artery banding that is there in, in dilated cardiomyopathy um, uh, that is occasionally being used. Dr. Beth Kaufman did give a lecture, I think a couple of years ago or last year. Uh, do go check out her um, lecture on the YouTube channel for CCF. And she talks about all of these, uh, some of these therapies in more detail. Uh, and then of course, I did not talk about heart transplantation, which is of course the final step in treatment of heart failure. I did wanna talk about quickly about um, my podcast. It's called In The Flow, Conversations with Pioneers in Pediatric Heart Failure. Uh, and then of course, there's another uh, podcast by Dr. Robert Pass called Pediatric Cardiology Today. Some of these also have resources, um, uh, uh, but talking just briefly about my podcast, we've had a few episodes out. The first one is by Dr. Lipschultz, who, uh, uh, you know, on the formation of the Pediatric Cardiomyopathy Registry. Uh, there's a, a, a podcast by uh, with Dr. Lori West um, and with Dr. Daphne Sue and Dr. Kirkland, who formed the Pediatric Heart Transplant Society. Uh, and then the one that is going to be coming out soon is going to be on the TMID trial for all those patients who have heart transplants uh, that is going to be out, out soon. Um, but, you know, these are easy conversations about how these societies and these, um, you know, uh, things came along in pediatric heart failure world. So if you're interested, do go check it out. It should be available on, available on all platforms. Um, and I, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions at this point in time. And my email is out there. So if you wanted to reach out to me uh, offline, please uh, feel free to do so. Once again, thank you so much to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation for giving me this opportunity um, for collaborating with all of you to do this educational web webinar today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bansell. That was wonderful and very informative. Um, we're going to open it up for questions. I know we've had a couple have come in so far. We um, will get through as many as we can in the next few minutes. And if there are any remaining questions that we um, don't have the opportunity to address, um, we will connect um, offline and then circulate Dr. Bansell's comments to you um, at a later date. So your questions will be um, uh, reviewed um, in some capacity. Uh, so no worries if we don't answer in live time right now. Um, but just a reminder, um, uh, please feel welcome to submit questions. We try to uh, keep them general in nature. And if you have specific medical questions, we encourage you to reach out to your, to your medical um, provider for those um, specific nuanced questions. Um, but first up is, um, can reverse remodeling be used with kids born with um, uh, HCM and LVH? Um. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, generally we use the term reverse remodeling for patients with dilated cardiomyopathies. Um, like I said, it's been really challenging to study all of these medications um, in a very uh, homogenous populations because pediatric heart failure is so um, uh, so heterogeneous, but patients who are born with uh, congenital heart disease um, who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, some of these medications are, especially like things like Lasix or decongestant therapies, are definitely used uh, in them. Uh, we often use ACE inhibitors like enalapril in these patients because um, you know we want to control their what we call afterload or their uh, systemic vascular resistance uh, to help with that single ventricle. Um, and so, so some of these medications have been tried. Um, we have um, you know societies like NPCQIC uh, that are collaborative efforts to study this in a more organized and systemic fashion. Um, so uh, the, the term reverse modeling to a certain extent maybe can be used in some patients with congenital heart disease, especially repaired two ventricle ones. However, in single ventricle, we think that there's, there are more things uh, to understand and, and research is still ongoing. So unfortunately, I don't think that you can use it 
black and white in, in that particular population. Okay, thank you. Can you speak a bit to CAMZIOS um, for children with HCM? Sure, sure. Kemzayos, uh, I'm assuming, is um, is Mavicamptan. So uh, Mavicamptan is, is a medication that has been studied in the adult world um, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It has been shown to... Um, um, to decrease the amount of hypertrophy and kind of let the heart relax because that is one of the big problems in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the heart becomes too thick. It's unable to relax. It's unable to fill, um, the left ventricle is unable to fill the blood to be able to pump it out to the body. So Mavicamptan has been um, approved in adults uh, to be used, unfortunately, um, uh, Unfortunately, in pediatric patients, it's not been studied. It's not been approved yet. Um, um, we have tried to get it for some of our patients, um, um, you know, as a compassionate use, and it has. It's currently not available. But there, there are a lot of talks that are ongoing to study this uh, drug in the pediatric population um, in an organized fashion. And, and I think once it, once trials have shown that it is safe to be used in pediatric population, I'm sure it will become available. Great, thank you. Um, regarding the heart failure registry you noted earlier, um, how do parents, um, is it for um, families to participate directly or do they have to do that through their healthcare provider? So, so at, it's through Action Learning Network, which is um, a cohort of different hospitals. It's about 50 to 60 sites. So most uh, sites are now part of Action Network. So uh, unfortunately, it is not direct patient um, uh, related. So the providers do have to enter the data. Um, um, and so definitely, you know, if if you you are interested in participating, go talk to your uh, heart failure doctor. And if they're part of the Action Learning Network, you can, you know, mention to them that you would be interested in being part of uh, the heart failure registry. Uh, and they can definitely uh, there are certain uh, there are certain uh, criteria that you have to meet to be able to be entered into the project, and so if you do meet that criteria, definitely they can enter your data. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, how do ACE inhibitors help with remodeling of the myocardium? Right. So, um, so ACE inhibitors, like I said, um, ACE is an enzyme that is produced uh, by the body. Um, ACE inhibitors. Um, uh, kind of literally like inhibit that enzyme from um, converting one protein, one protein called angiotensin one to angiotensin two. Um, that kind of activates what we call uh, renin angiotensin system in the body, RAS. Um, it, if you have that conversion to angiotensin two, the RAS activation kind of um, uh, causes us to um, hold on to fluid, hold on to salt, causes fluid overload. So ACE sort of blocks, um, ACE inhibitors block that enzyme, prevents us from having all that fluid retention, all that, um, you know, salt retention, and, and, and kind of decreases what we call preload on the heart. So it, it, it decreases, um, 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 you know, all the heart being kind of dilated, all that fluid retention kind of makes the heart dilated. And so it kind of helps with Remod reverse remodeling in that way where it tries to decongest um, uh, the body and, and sort of helps uh, in that way. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I know we're just about at the hour, so I'm going to move to the next slide to just do a couple of um, reminders um, uh, for our audience. And so if there um, are remaining, there are a couple of questions left, so we will get you um, uh, Dr. Benzel's uh, thoughts on those. So um, uh, so no worries if, if we didn't get to you or your question right now. Um, but a couple of heart failure resources I just wanted to note um, is that there is the Pediatric Heart Failure Guide that we have on our CCF website. Um, it's a downloadable guide. It's very thorough. Um, so I encourage you to check that out as an additional resource um, that you can find on our site. And then I also just wanted to mention that this week is actually Heart Failure Awareness Week. And so it was, um, you know, wonderful to have this webinar um, during uh, that week. And our colleagues at the Heart Failure Society of America are doing a lot of great uh, social media awareness um, 
raising. So I encourage you to, to check out their uh, social media channels and you can see some other information on some of those initiatives for this week. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, again, thank Dr. Bansell for joining us today. Um, this was a great talk and um, really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with, with our families and, um, and our CCF network. Um, this webinar will be um, posted on our website, um, and, and we will have upcoming webinar registration information posted on our webpage there as well. And in the meantime, please stay informed. Uh, keep in touch with us um, on our social media channels and on our website and through our news updates. So um, please reach out with any questions. Um, and again, thank you all for your time and participation. And Dr. Bensell, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Gina, and to all the uh, CCF team for helping me um, give this webinar today. And I look forward to collaborating again in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.